try not just to apply and go there for the prestige um, because it, it's it, at the end it is just a job and like um, there are some really incredible things you can do in big tech and some unique opportunities but it, it is still just a job so yeah just think well if this is the right one for you as well but um, if it is then definitely apply uh, apply relentlessly all right so Hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer, I'm a data scientist at IWOCA and I will be your host. So today our guest is Remy Unagela. Remy is a senior data science manager at TikTok and before this he had a few experiences. He worked at Google and worked at Amazon. Prior to that he did a master in data science at City University and a bachelor in math and physics at University College London. So if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel, comment, share the episode, and leave a five-star review. All right, let's start now. Hi, Remy. How is it going? Hope everything is going well from you in the, U in the US. Hey, Neil. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I, I can definitely echo what you just said, folks. Like, definitely subscribe to Neil's uh... Uh, channel. It's uh, I've been watching a few of your episodes and they're very entertaining and very informative as well. So thank you again for having me on. Thanks. No, my pleasure. Looking forward to this conversation. And yeah, first thing I want to ask is how did you actually get into this world of data science, machine learning, and AI? How did you get into the field? Yeah, it was a it was a bit by accident, to be honest. So I was studying uh, maths and physics during my bachelor's at UCL, and I was surrounded by people who wanted to go either in finance or consulting. So naturally, I was like, all right, let's uh, let's try to choose either finance or consulting. Finance sound, sounded like you could make a lot of money from it, right? It's a bank. Bank equals money. So um, during my time at UCL, I was like, I'm going to apply to all, all of these internships in finance. Um, but I'm also going to apply to some internships where like my math background is probably going to be more valued and I have a higher chance of, of getting an internship, right? The goal was like, I need, I think, I think with work experience, I'll have an easier time, you know, getting a job later on. Um, I interviewed for Goldman Sachs, completely tanked the interview. Uh, but thankfully some of the other places that I applied to, um, one of those places, Schlumberger actually accepted my internship application. I didn't really know what I was applying for at the time, to be very honest. Um, I was ca casting a fairly wide net and what the internship turned out to be was this was back in 2013 so the term big data was starting to get a lot of hype and so Schlumberger had hired me because there was they were they wanted to try on machine learning and at the time you know Python, scikit-learn, all of these tools weren't so developed so there was this company that had made a software that was a machine learning software and they were charging their license a hundred thousand dollars a year per user so before making that investment, Schlumberger thought, let's get an intern. We're going to, you know, and so I, I was in there for like three or four months in the summer. Um, and I got a, like a trial version of the software, right? And so basically it was a fairly simple problem. It was a prediction problem where this was an oil and gas company and they had, they basically have sensors and you wanted to predict when a sensor would fail. This way, when you're changing one, you can also change like the next 10 that are going to fail this day or this week and you prevent downtime. Um, and so that was my introduction to the world of machine learning. And it was a lot of data wrangling using Excel, um, a lot of machine learning using, you know, drag and drop software, but I learned how to clean data. I learned how to evaluate the performance of a machine learning model. Even if I didn't know what the model was at the time, um, like I, I gained a lot of basically insights into this and into, into just like the day-to-day -day work at a, at, a, at a high level of a data scientist. But um, I did that, I, I got really interested and so I came back the next year um, again to Schlumberger, this time for a different internship. I was building a visualization tool in R. Um, so it's kind of my first time really coding outside of MATLAB and university. And so that was, you know, kind of a second aspect of data science, right? Dashboarding, programming, you know, data wrangling using programming and not just Excel, drag and drop. Um, and then, you know, I, I did these two and I realized that I really like this, this data science thing. And so I got my master's in data science and, and that's how it kind of started. Okay. So the internship was before your master or was it yeah. in between? Two, I got two internships before my master's. So okay. kind of summer, summer of my first year 
and then summer of my second year at UCL. All right, then you do your master in data science and then you start yeah. working at Amazon, is that right? Third internship before that. <laughs> okay. Uh, still at Schlumberger. So my first two were in the Oslo um, office in Norway. My third one was in the Boston office here in the US on the East Coast. Um, and so the third one was, this was a, basically to graduate from my master's, you had a choice. You could either do what they call like an academic project of a professor and over three months in the summer, you had some beefy machine learning project to do, or you could get um, industry experience for six months and do an internship. You still have to do a report. It still had to be fairly rigorous. Um, but obviously I, uh, I, I preferred the internship route. Um, so I went back and this was six months of really kind of hands-on uh, Python machine learning. I had like this, the, the cloud was starting to pick off, but I had this like beefy GPU unit under my desk. Um, and just, yeah, it was it was a really interesting six month research project. Again, classification problem ultimately, um, learned a lot. And then after that, I, I jumped into Amazon. So Amazon was your first full-time job after uni? That's right. Or That's even right. ever. So, Thinking about this a bit, how do you, well, you just finished university, obviously you did a bunch of internships, but no full-time experience. How do you actually get a job at a big tech like Amazon? It's probably one of the most competitive job um, nowadays. So yeah, how did you do? What would be your advice? Yeah, um, it was really tough, honestly. I, I left university with a bit of a big ego. I was like, because in between all of my internships, if you add them up, I had about a year of experience, right? Um, I had a bachelor's from a fairly good school. I had a master's where I had learned a lot of applied stuff. I was like, oh, this, this should be easy, right? Google wants to hire me, of course. <laughs> um, no, not so much. <laughs> so I applied to every data role. I could think of in Amazon, right? It was data analyst, data scientist, business intelligence engineer. They have all of these different titles and I didn't get a single answer. So then what I ended up doing is I started applying for internships. I really didn't want another internship because by then I had just, I had come out of a six month internship, had a year under my belt, didn't exactly feel like I needed or wanted one. Um, but I applied for internships and I got an answer um, and I got an interview. And so they send you out this, this like, I think it was SQL or Excel. I can't remember. I think it was an Excel test. So they sent me out this Excel test, um, which I was, was very straightforward. And then I, it was four rounds of interviews, even for an internship. So I do round one, round two, round three. I do fairly well. And in round four, it's with a hiring manager. And I, so it's like, finally, I get to talk to a hiring manager. Um, and I tell them like, look, I don't want an internship. I've just come out of a year of, of experience. Um, I'd like a full-time position, right? And so he, lucky me, he has a full-time position available. I did fairly well in the first three. So he, um, so he's like, no problem. Let's start another loop. So it was another round of interviews. Um, and I failed that round, but mm -hmm. some out of my new panel, uh, I think it was the second one. Um, that person was also hiring for his team and he liked me. And so I got in, in that team. So it was like internship full-time, not that one, another one, um, is basically persistence, <laughs> to be honest, and a lot of luck, uh, just a ton of luck. Okay. And then in the end, you made it, you start at Amazon. So can you talk a bit about your role there? What did you do during those few years at Amazon? What was your role yeah. there? Sure. So it, it was interesting because, um, it, when you join, at least when I joined Amazon, um, I was expected like, so what I thought was happen was like, you come in, right. And you get given some problems to solve. Not so much. Amazon thrives. Like Amazon has these 14 leadership principles. Um, and one of them is ownership. And one of the things they push a lot is that you need to own the area that you're in. So when I joined, um, I was basically told I now own a part of the UK supply chain network, right? Um, so I was working on the amazon.com or .co.uk side of the business. And it was the, the goal basically was to make sure that the inventory was well spread out across, um, across the warehouses, because the, the goal for the year was basically to have all the parcels get to customers faster. So there's a lot of ways to do that. My team was focusing on spreading inventory well across the network. Um, and so the challenge that I faced initially was that you don't actually like, that's it. Like this is, this is your job description. Like you're not told 
use machine learning to solve X, Y, and Z problem, right? Or it's incredibly ambiguous. And I think that's one of the huge challenges of big tech. And it's, it, it's something I struggled with for a long time, um, even past Amazon to an extent. And so that's it, like you're the owner of this network. So um, part of my projects, right? I, I did some machine learning, which went in production and that saved the company a bunch of money. But I was also on the phone with like warehouse managers um, and they were telling me like, they were telling me that their warehouses were getting full, even if our metrics weren't reflecting that, or um, that you know, you know they wanted a lot more small units because that was better for the size of bins that they had. And so, like, it, it's it's just it was such an interesting role, but at the same time, it was so ambiguous, especially at the beginning. Um, and and the thing that I didn't do fast enough, which I would advise anyone to do in this conditions, is I kind of felt ashamed to be honest, because I was like, I know all of these skills. I just can't find a problem to solve. And like, it felt so silly. Um, and like, it was basically like, I, I wasn't really engaging with my manager as much as I should have. And like, he was he was really good, but I was kind of hiding this this point. Um, so yeah, like if you're definitely in this position, like I think the, the role of your manager in big tech is to help you through this ambiguity. Um, and like, I, I was doing work, but not the work I wanted to do. And so it took me a while to find my first, it took me over a year to find my first machine learning project. And that's all I wanted to do out of university was like just to apply the cool stuff I had learned in a practical real world. Um, and yeah, it, it was, anyways, um, it was a good experience, but it, it took me some time to, to navigate the ambiguity. Interesting. So it looks like you were kind of a consultant, basically. They give you a problem and then they tell you, yeah, find a way to, to make it work. Pretty much, and yeah, but it's it's like it's a problem, but like it's such a high level problem. It's like it's like you know if you get hired by Facebook and they tell you make us more money, like it's like this type of problem, right? Like it, and like that's where that's where I think I struggle, and I think that's where it's hard outside of you, like when you leave university, like you're not, especially if you come out of it with a technical degree, like you're just you have skills and you know how to apply, but. You need to be get, you need to be given like the space to apply them in, um, and the people that did really well in Amazon were those that were able to just thrive in the ambiguity and like they understood how to navigate it. But more importantly, they also they knew how to ask for help, um, and that was a that was a mindset that took me some time to switch. You know, like at school you work alone. Like if you get help in an exam, you're cheating and you fail. Uh, at work, it's the opposite. It's like the goal is to solve the problem. And if you can involve more people, to be honest, it's usually better for your performance, right? It means you're you're able to grab for people around a project. Um, yeah. Is that a mistake you made then, not asking for help early enough? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I wasn't asking for help. I also, I think I was, at some point I was, you know, like the, um, what's it called? I can't remember, just this curve. But at some point, you, you, just, you don't even know what you don't know. So like, you don't even know what to ask for. You just, you're so lost, you don't. But at least, yeah, the, the first year I felt fairly lost, um, but I, I still should have asked more for help. And what I do now that I manage a team um, is now that I've, because I, I was in that position not so long ago at the end, um, especially for more junior employees or for, for with not so much tenure, um, I try to be a bit proactive and, and kind of like, is this a problem you're facing? Because I think if you're working in big tech, it's the problem is there, right? Maybe you're good at handling it and maybe you're not. But if you're not good at handling it, like we need to solve it because nothing, nothing else will come until you solve this problem. Yeah, I feel like one to ones. I usually have one to ones with my manager or with other people from the team where I would just talk about the problem that I'm solving, even if I don't have issues. Like just talking about about the problem, they will share ideas and they will say, "Oh, and did you think about this? Or do you have this issue?" And yeah, just randomly talking about the project can help quite a lot. And maybe maybe people feel they really need a precise question if they want to get help, but sometimes just talking about the project can help a lot. 100%. And another thing that I found quite interesting, like I wouldn't expect this kind of high level task at Amazon. Like it almost looks like a startup, right? You would join a startup and they will tell you, make us more money. But mm -hmm. at Amazon or Google or TikTok, I would expect you to, you know, optimize a specific model and try to improve the accuracy by 1% or 2% yeah. because this has a huge impact on the business. Is that not the case or? 
So it is the case, um, but not for the not for data science teams. So what has ended up happening in big tech over the past I don't know how many years is there's there's a hyper specialization of roles. So I think it's important that if you're at university and what you love is machine learning, and you want to work, let's say in big tech, um, you're not you're likely not like. So there's like if we look at the data pyramid, right? Um, there's basically machine learning engineers. Um, and data scientists are becoming two very different roles. Um, and so if, if what you love is machine learning, if what you love is optimizing models, the machine learning teams, my understanding is that mm -hmm. they have a lot less ambiguity, right? Um, here, your job is to, you know, you know, you have an ML model to improve it, to bring a new one in, to bring, to think of new architectures, but like the ambiguity is, you have less business ambiguity. Um, I don't want to speak too much on their behalf. I've, I've never worked in an ML team, but there's the difference. Data science seems we still use ML, right? I've still put ML models into prod, but it's it, it's it's a bit different. What's the main difference? Like, is it the the goal is more high level? Is it the tools that you're using as well? Yeah, I think you're you're a little bit closer to the business in some sense. Um, I think you can think of so machine learning engineer is what I used to think was a data scientist, but so you're doing ML or you're thinking of ML all day at least, right? You might not be doing ML, but you're thinking of ML all day. Um, as a data scientist, we're doing a lot more A-B testing. We're doing a lot more metric developments. So this one is hugely important. You don't really get, it's hard to teach at university. Maybe it's possible. Um, but you know, what is the metric we need to be looking at? What is the, what is the right North Star metric, right? So like, if you look at all of these startups when they started, like Airbnb focused on like number of nights booked, right? Uh, WhatsApp focused on number of messages uh, sent. Like that seems obvious, but you could choose to have your North Star metric for WhatsApp, say being number of users, right? Um, number of distinct users. Like there's all these things that you have to think of. And so that's a huge part, especially now at TikTok, that's a huge part of what data science teams do here at least is what are the right metrics that we need to look at to drive the business in the right direction? What are the metrics that just bring noise? Um, and like just developing new metrics and that's a huge part. So yeah, A-B testing, metric development, some ML. Um, ML is used a lot for its explainability. So if you do, mm -hmm. you know, regressions or any model that has explainability powers, so that is very powerful as well. Um, but it's less of the machine learning models that get put in productions, right? So if for TikTok, it's not the data science teams that work on the recommendation engines, right? Or for Google or Reels now, I guess. Um, those would be the ML engineers. So is it right to say that data scientists are a bit more full stack? They will do a bit of ML, a bit of business thinking, a bit of data scientist, a bit of data analysis, I guess, to define the metrics um, and things like that. Whereas ML engineers are maybe more specialized, right? Uh, thinking about models all day. Yeah, that that's pretty accurate. Um, that's pretty accurate. The, the difference is we don't have anywhere near the same depth of knowledge mm -hmm. for ML. Right. Yeah. So it's not like we can do their jobs, yeah. but they can do ours. Um, like, you know, we can run 30, like, you know, you know, this, right. Like we can run 30 simple machine learning models and then we have enough knowledge that we could go deep if necessary, but it's just never necessary because you have like these incredible teams that know how to do it faster and have all the infrastructure set up and, and can do it for you. What it lets you do though, I will say the data science team, I, I think, especially in big tech companies, you're in a cool position because I think you're at the center of all the other technical teams. You work very closely with data engineers, with machine learning engineers, potentially with AI researchers, which is again, usually a different team, um, potentially with business analysts, sometimes the role gets absorbed. Um, it's, it's interesting because then you get to drive projects, either you get to drive projects technically, or because you're able to understand each of these roles, right? you can do a little bit of data pipelining. So you understand what a data engineer can do. You can do a bit of AI research, you can do a bit of ML modeling. Um, you're able to craft these big projects and get people around you. Um, and so I find that also the role of the data scientist in some ways sometimes can become like a bit of a program manager where you're just, you're thinking of projects and maybe you're designing the success metrics or you're implementing the A-B test, but you can also kind of think at a high level of what the project it should look like and how the different stakeholders should interact. Um, and I realized that me personally, I enjoyed that a lot more for example, then opening my Python um, notebooks and coding. And so that's something I lean toward a lot, um, especially in, in TikTok, because I, I realized that was something I enjoyed a lot more. And it's it's a possibility that you have, um, because again, the role isn't just for you to have impact. The role is on your own is just to bring 
benefits of the business, no matter how. So can we dive into like one particular project that you worked on at Amazon? Is there one that you're thinking about that could be interesting? Um, maybe one where you used AI and ML? Yeah, um, for sure. So the, so basically I'll, I'll give you a tiny bit of context. I'll try to keep it short. Um, there are different, there, there are basically two different types of warehouses at a simple level, right? There's the warehouses you think about, which are all over the UK or all over Europe, but I was focused on the UK. So all over the UK and they have all the stuff you want to buy on amazon.co.uk. When you press order, it ships from the warehouse easy. Mm -hmm. There are two ways for items to get into a warehouse. Either it gets shipped directly from the seller um, or to save on cost, the seller can send it to a special type of warehouse that doesn't store inventory. It'll just it'll take big shipments and then it splits it across the network. It's called a cross dock, right? And so I had ownership on this cross dock part of the network. So again, like big inventory comes in and it gets split. The interesting part of working at Amazon was the the algorithms that dictated how inventory was split was so complex that we couldn't predict in advance what was going to happen. We couldn't predict if we send this item in, like where is it going to end up in how many, more importantly, how many warehouses is it going to end up in? So this special type of warehouse, it's only profitable if the items get sent to multiple warehouses, right? If you send it to this warehouse and it gets sent to just one or it gets split into two different parcels, it's not really profitable to add this extra step, right? Mm -hmm. You have to pay people, you have to pay trucks. And again, we're in this crazy position where we can't even forecast what's going to happen. It still blows my mind. Um, mm -hmm. So I just built a machine learning model that was able to forecast where what our own other model was going to do, uh, which sounds a bit ridiculous. but um, And so it was basically uh, very binary. Like, is this going to end up in, you know, I think it was three or four, I can't remember, uh, more warehouses if it goes through this cross stock. If it does, it's profitable for us and we shouldn't do it. If it's not, we should just send it to one warehouse and save on a ton of costs. Um, and so that was the machine learning problem. Let's predict how it's going to get split. And so the data you look at is you look at like historical demand, you look at uh, inventory levels in different warehouses. And it's it's a very, it's a classification problem. I remember using XJ Boost to train it. Um, I remember putting the mod machine learning model in production using a lot of like patchy tools. So like I put in myself on EC2 and data was getting pulled from S3 and Redshift. And like I had these Chrome jobs running on EC2. Um, it was kind of messy, but it worked. Last I heard, uh, which was I think a month ago, it's still being used, which is kind of incredible. Nice. Um, but yeah, so that was, I think that's the best example I have. That's actually quite cool. So it was the idea to basically, you've got lots of items that are coming to this What's the name of the warehouse? I forgot this. The uh, cross dock. Yeah, the, the cross dock, right? Um, and so you want to predict, you've got a bunch of items and you want to predict in which other warehouse they're going to be sent to. And if your model predicts that they're all going to go to the same warehouse, then there is no point sending them to this cross dock. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So you wanted to see your model predicting different warehouses for different items, basically. Yeah. Exactly. If it predicts that it's going to go in many warehouses, then it's it's worth it to do it. And mm -hmm. that was it. It was very binary. Um, and so what the, what the end result was basically we were able to cut down on like 30% of the items we were sending to the warehouse, uh, to the cross dock, sorry. And we were just sending them directly to a single warehouse. So we saved them. It was a million dollars of savings a year. Um, the other cool part of working at Amazon or other big tech companies is that by their scale, you know, it's what you said three questions ago, right? A 1% saving is a huge amount of savings. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of the part of the appeal of working in big tech is that you have, like the impact is big almost by default, right? Like if you, you change one thing, it impacts potentially billions of users now. Um, the downside obviously is you have less organizational impact, right? So I have friends that work in startups and you can, you can change their tech stack. You can change almost the direction of the business. Um, like you can't do that at Amazon, obviously. <laughs> and so there's like, there's this balance of like different types of impacts you can have. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, I guess it's good to keep in mind when you're thinking of applying to big tech. And what was like the biggest challenge in this classification? problem what is the biggest problem you 
you encounter? Was it, yeah. I don't know, the data, the model, the production bit? Um, I think putting it in production was challenging because at the time, my team wasn't putting machine learning models in production, right? And one of the things that you do when you're learning how to do ML at school, at least that was my case in university, you know, you're doing your Jupyter notebook and that's the end of the project. And when I did my internships, especially my last one, it was in a research center. So this was just to develop a proof of concept. So again, Jupyter notebook or whatever, you're trained, it works, evaluation metrics, and you move on. So I was I was putting machine learning model in production without anyone. So no one in my team around me at Amazon had done it. I had never done it. So it was very a lot of patchwork. Um, it did work in the end. And then the other the other difficulty was the success metrics. So you have your accuracy and your predictions, which can be correct. But again, like going back to how data scientists design success metrics, what we were interested in doing was we were interested in basically. The point of the model initially wasn't to save on cost. It was actually to optimize on the fullness of the, where the, the network. I wanted to make sure we were sending the right units to the cross doc so mm -hmm. that it was getting spread out and we could see the, the fullness level of the network increase in some ways. Um, and the project was a fail from that standard. And so initially I actually thought the project was going to get scrapped because um, basically the fullness levels were identical. Like, because I, so I do the, I do the model and then I do an AB test and I'm seeing identical fullness levels. I'm like, well, I just spent like six months working on this and it's useless. Um, but then I checked, all right, what, how many units am I actually sending to get the similar fullness level? And I was start sending, I think 30% less. Um, and so I, I kind of, I almost dismissed the project. I was this close to, to throwing it away because I didn't look at, I didn't take, a, I almost didn't take a step back enough, um, and look at like, okay, well, how am I performing against all metrics, not just my initial goal, which was fullness. I'm actually saving the company a bunch of money. Yeah, like it's not the initial goal, but like it's a huge win, right? We take this process that's not efficient, we make it 30% more efficient. Great, right? It's not better, but it's like more efficient. Yeah, so metric is quite, I guess in industry, thinking about the metric is quite, yeah. quite important and maybe something that's not done often enough yeah it's hard to do um at least in university you you, you like you need to kind of be in in a, in a certain business context you need to like mm -hmm. just you go to enough meetings you talk to enough people and you start understanding kind of like the drivers of some things but if i remember like a university course is 30 hours like it's yeah mm -hmm. it, it's something you just have to learn on the job um and it's amazing because you you see the right level like like I see my leaders just obsess over metrics and like, so in Amazon, we like people were in Amazon, the business was fairly, Amazon supply chain is fairly old now. Right. Um, so like the metrics were fairly set in stone, but mm -hmm. at TikTok, for example, where the business is much newer, I'm seeing our leaders just obsess over like, what are the right metrics? What metrics should we be looking at? And like, they'll get revamped from time to time to new metrics will get introduced. Um, some metrics by the way are expensive to compute, right? Like not all metrics are just, a new formula in Excel. And it's something that like I'm learning a lot as well is again, like the right map, like what are the metrics we need to drive? Because it, like once you get your whole org aligned on the right metric, like everyone knows where they're going. And I, when you join an org that's naturally like that, like it was at Amazon, I didn't even realize to an extent that that was what's happening, right? Like you go to work, like these legendary Amazon weekly business reviews where you have leaders literally reading like a 30 page document. It's just tables, it's black and white. There's not a single graph and like they're just obsessed over all these metrics. And it's interesting because now TikTok, I get to see these being built and like how hard mm -hmm. it is to build um, and how easy it is to make mistakes if you're not careful. And it's, it, it's a hugely important part of, I think, data science work is just guiding towards the right metrics. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And even where I work, I sometimes defining the right metric and monitoring this metric is just a project on its own. Like first you mm -hmm. need to define the right metric, but then you need to monitor it and it could be different, monitored differently for different projects. Like for example, there is a big metric in our company and sometimes we have a frequentist view. Sometimes we use Bayesian models to also quantify the uncertainty that we have around it. And yeah, it could be quite surprising that you're spending just a lot of time trying to understand how much you know about a particular metric but yeah defining and monitoring 
the right metrics can often define whether projects are successful or not. And that's actually quite important because if you just work a lot on projects that don't have any impact, I guess, yeah, you're not going to be very useful. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, let's move on to the next chapter or your, of your life. I mean, you got into data science by doing a bunch of internship. You did this master in data science, then another internship. Then you ended up at Amazon. You moved to Google. And after Google, you're now a senior data science manager at TikTok. So yeah, let's talk a bit about TikTok. What exactly is your role there? How did your role evolve uh, when you arrived since today? And yeah, what do you do at TikTok? Yeah, I've been at TikTok for two, two and a half years, almost three years now. Um, so I joined the, the trust and safety team. <clears throat> so it's a team responsible or the org responsible for making sure um, that the platform is safe, right? That you don't see, you know, whether it's bullying or it's hate speech, you know, you have all of these characterization of what is content that we allow on the platform and what is content we don't allow on the platform. Um, it's it's a huge, huge, insane team. But the obviously there is a there's a data science pillar, and I was the first data scientist in Europe that got hired. Um, and then they hired my boss, and then they hired the team grew. Um, and so as the team grew, it was interesting because I got to take on a lot of different hats. Right, um, you take on a hat, and the team grows, and you're kind of offboard, offboard, offboarding a topic to someone, and you kind of do that enough. And so I got a really nice wide exposure to to the business. Um, and as the team grew more and more, there was an opportunity for me to manage a team. Right, and so I there was an area that I was focusing on. Um, and we realized we needed more headcount and my boss like was at capacity. So I got the opportunity to start managing um, fairly early on, which I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And the team grew. And very recently I moved uh, from the Dublin office, obviously to the San Francisco office where I'm now managing multiple data science teams, still in trust and safety. Uh, so still under the, the, same, the same goal. Can you talk a bit about the challenges behind trust and safety? Like, first of all, why do we need AI and what are the challenges there just on a high level view? Yeah, I'll talk about the, the, the problems maybe the industry faces. Um, mm -hmm. So th the reason the reason you need AI are basically because of the scale of these companies, right? Um, there are millions and millions of users and millions of videos. And so... The way moderation works in social media is you basically have human moderation. So you have people that look at content and you also have machine learning models that review content. Um, and sometimes the machine learning model makes a decision. Sometimes the machine learning model will just say, this might be violating, let's get a human to review it, right? There's a huge complex mechanisms behind the logics. But overall, this, this is what all companies do, right? YouTube, basically YouTube, uh, Twitch, TikTok, um, there's a few more reels. And so, so you need machine learning because you need scale. And the biggest challenge you have is, you know, in, uh, in every other industry I worked in, whether I was supply chain for Amazon or oil and gas in my internships, Google, I was working in ads, you always have a ground truth, right? Like in Amazon, like, you know what time the parcel leaves, you know what time it arrives, and so you can compute how long it takes to deliver. And so you can optimize against that metric. In social media and in trust and safety, like the way you know that a piece of content is violating is it because a human marked it as violating, right? And so a human might say, this, I think this is, this is bullying and this needs to get taken down, for example. The problem is humans are not perfect at doing that. And so your labeled data set that you, you need to train all of your models on is also imperfect. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way to have a perfect data set. Like it's just not possible. Um, and so there's a lot of mechanisms in play for like, how do we, like, how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this lack of data? Whether it's for the machine learning or everything else, you know, so you're designing your metrics and well, how do you design metrics that have this into place? And then, okay, you've designed your metrics. How do you get your stakeholders to trust your metrics, right? Because they know about the imperfect nature of the labeling. And so they know that the metric might not be a hundred percent accurate because right, obviously just, it, it might not be. Um, and so that's the biggest challenge I find as a data scientist is you just, you don't have this ground truth. And so you, you're either designing ML models on imperfect data or 
you're designing metrics on imperfect data and then you have to get your stakeholders to trust these metrics. And you have to also think to yourself, like, should I trust these metrics? That's that's a big challenge. So you're kind of always unsure. That's that's quite interesting. And it's also a big difference, I guess, between industry and academia. Like in academia or during a master, you often work with a fixed data set and you can trust, actually trust the data. Whereas in industry, very often, first of all, it's difficult to get this data. You don't just get a nice table with all the data that you need. But as you mentioned, it's, it can sometimes be incomplete or even wrong, um, mislabeled for some examples. And yeah, that's a big difference compared to academia. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge challenge. Is there... Yeah, I mean, what can we do to to improve this? Or what? What? It's, what do? You, yeah. It, it's it's um so, so there's a few different things. Um, I mean, at a high level, it, it's it's a problem that all social media faces. Um, but I think especially around the trust of metrics, um, that's something that uh, data science teams, our data science teams, think a lot of spend a lot of time thinking, right? Like we design a metric and maybe our stakeholders just don't trust it. Um, and so like we are in the business of proving to them, but also to ourselves that the metric is relevant, right? That if we do a deep dive, let's say for a specific country where people have expertise and they have some market knowledge, right? Like, All right, well, okay, I, I, I see the metric here makes sense. So I think I can trust the metric just overall. Mm -hmm. um, like building trust around metrics is something that, that we've done that it's funny because it's kind of like just, it's building trust around metric. It's also building data culture in general. Um, there's definitely the challenge, right? When, when the metric is not always reliable, but it's funny because when I, when I worked at Amazon, my boss used to, my first boss used to tell me all the time that my analysis never had to be correct. They just have to be directionally correct, right? We need to go for you to go left or right. We don't need to go to the exact angle that we need to go. It's like this way or that way. And for a lot of decisions we make in business, that's usually enough as well, right? Like, do we increase our presence here or do we decrease it? Like we don't, mm -hmm. and, and then you just adjust and you, you course correct. And so there is a bit of that as well. So sometimes you can't, right? Because sometimes you're dealing with extremely sensitive information or extremely sensitive problems. But there's a lot of times where we don't actually need the accuracy we think we do. Um, and so there's also sometimes just pushing to get past that mental hurdle of like, we think this is inaccurate. It's like, it might not be 100% accurate, but it's mm -hmm. also not going to be 100% wrong, right? It's like directionally, we're in the right spot. And so it's also kind of conveying that message that like, if you just start fighting for perfection, you're just, you're just going to get lost. And like, you're just going to, the projects never get finished and you just never go anywhere. Yeah, I think that's something that I often see. Like usually when you're data scientist, you like maths, you like to be right and so you you kind of like you kind of want to have the perfect model that takes everything into account and you know that your model predicts with i don't know 87.54 percent accuracy and you want to get the exact value of how good your model is um to make sure you're saving the business an exact amount of money and usually as you mentioned it's good enough to be in the right direction. You don't need to know the exact value, like you're saving your business $1,562,000 a month. You know, you, you just need to just need to know that you're saving your business money. Obviously you need to have a ballpark figure, but you it sometimes it's just not worth it to make things more complex, make things more precise. Um, having a ballpark answer or something that works well enough is sometimes, yeah, good enough. You don't need to waste time digging further into things mm -hmm. for sure and i don't know yeah i feel sometimes people you might actually be less efficient if you just spend too long trying to get the exact answer and that's that's an issue i feel like i feel that data scientists sometimes have just trying to be exactly right i agree i think when you when you get in i think most people get into data science you know you're like you're, you're very you're very technical, you're very curious, you're a bit geeky about your models and your your tooling and your environment and setting up, you know, Conda versus poetry or whatnot. Um, and you can you can lose a lot of time um, trying to aim for perfection. And it's, 
it's it's usually not rewarded. Um, and you 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 I think it's one of the mindsets I also had to, you know when I joined Amazon. I remember I was thinking to myself like all I want to do is build cool shit. That was it. That was it. Like I didn't really care about the business impact. I was mm-hmm. like I, I love machine learning. I just want to do machine learning here now. Um, and I, it took me some time, but like you have to switch a mentality to like you're actually you're here to bring value to the business. And if it's an approximate model, that's great. If it's like Excel has a regression feature. If that's what it mm-hmm. takes, that's also cool. Um, like, you know, that's fine. Um, like whatever it takes to, to get the job done. But I think, yeah, getting lost in perfection is just a good way to make sure you, you never have much impact or you don't progress as fast as you could. Yeah, that's a good point. We also had like a similar experience when I arrived to this, I'm working in the credit risk companies who were lending money. And when I arrived, my first thing was like, okay, why don't we use deep learning for our credit risk model? Let's go and use deep learning. Um, and then actually you realize, well, you need more data. Um, deep learning is less interpretable. Uh, you might get a better model, but you won't really understand it. And so, yeah, sometimes simple solutions might work better, even if they are slightly less precise. Simple models often do the job because they're more interpretable. They are easier to understand, right? For you and for your stakeholders. And yeah, you can get things done in a week, whereas a deep learning model might take, yeah, much longer. So yeah, I, I've seen more deep learning projects start and fail than start and succeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I think it's always good to just start simple. Like even if you want to build a deep learning model, just start with a regression or something, show that it works, and then you can increase complexity if you need. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. So just to switching topics a bit, looking at the overall picture. So you worked at Amazon. Google and TikTok, three big tech companies. Um, I'm just wondering, are they all the same? Is it basically the same working at different big techs or are there any differences between those different companies? Yeah, I mean, in some ways they're very similar. Um, in other ways, they're so massive that like just working in two different teams, you can have two radically different experiences, right? Um, I, I will say that what I've noticed at a high level is that like what, what's been different at TikTok than at Google or Amazon is that Google and Amazon felt like very established companies. Um, and what I mean by that is that at TikTok, I feel like we're still building a lot of stuff um, from and what that means is that there's, you know, like Google, for example, had the best tools. That's just like straight down the best tools. Like everything was well integrated. Like it, you had a UI for everything. It was just perfect. Um, TikTok is a bit the opposite of that because it's a bit younger and not everything is as polished. But like, if you think of yourself more in terms of building your career, you also have a lot more opportunities, right? Because you're building stuff from the ground up and that's pretty exciting, right? Like I was brought in on Amazon to support a part of the UK supply chain network. Um, I was brought in at TikTok to like help build and grow and define the trust and safety data science team because you know you're the first hire and then the team grows a lot around that. So you get a lot of you get to build a lot of that stuff from scratch and that's really exciting. Um, and that's also really like in your career there's not so many opportunities to do that, especially in big tech. Um, and so that's to me that's been the main difference. You know, there's a lot of other differences as well, mm-hmm. some more funny differences like Amazon gives you free f- snacks twice a week, you know, whereas the food at Google is fairly legendary. Um, like there's, there's, like a, there's cultural differences as well, a little bit where to me, Amazon had the best data culture. Um, like all of these companies are data driven, like no decision gets made with just a gut feeling, but the way data was drilled into you at Amazon was just unreal. I found the pace of work a bit intense, to be honest, but I feel like it was a great place to learn a lot of best practices for like how to work. Um, how to do good work, like what does it mean to do good quality work where, you know, you do good quality work in all these companies, but Amazon really raises the bar um, and the intensity, at least in my team. Uh, But again, the teams are so different. It's, it's kind of, it's hard to make these big generalizations. Um, I'm I'm enjoying my role at TikTok. Mostly, I think a huge part of it initially was because again, there was this, this team you had to grow and from scratch. And that was very, very exciting to me. What do you mean by the best data culture? Can you? Yeah. Um, so all 
all leaders in these companies use data to make decisions, but not all of your stakeholders necessarily will to the same extent. So a very concrete example, all program managers at Amazon are expected, actually, you don't have to learn SQL when, when you get to, uh, to Amazon, but if you're a program manager and you join Amazon, you're expected to learn SQL in like three weeks, um, faster if possible. No one's gonna help you pull data for you. That is not the case at Google and TikTok, right? Here, we have data scientists or data analysts that will help some program managers like pull basic data, build in basic dashboards. And so to me, Amazon's data strong, data culture was stronger because like, I, I really think that if you're a program manager and you know how to pull your own data and build your own dashboards, and like, you know this, right? Like if, if you know your data well, you know your problem well, and you can find solutions. If you're relying on others, it's super slow. It's kind of, if you're getting, if your data scientists are spending 30% of their time building dashboards, it's really not the best use of their time um, for you, for the business, for their team. So I felt like people in Amazon were much more data independent and it, it, it made them be able to do better decisions, decisions more quickly. Um, yeah, it, and it's something that like, it, I'm trying to push here in, in my current team, in my current environment for, but it's hard, you know, like it, it's at the end of company culture. So you can't do too much to change it, but you can, you can try. So educate non-technical or less technical people to be comfortable with data. Obviously they won't be able to, I don't know, train a machine learning model in Python, but at least they will know how to pull the data that they need to be more independent and rely less on technical people. Yeah, that that's, um, to me, that, that's a huge win if, if you're able to do that um, in, in the environment you're in, because it's not just a huge win for your time, it's a huge win for them. Like, I really think if you're able to manipulate data better, you're able to make better decisions. Um, and you can't expect it from everyone. Like at some point, your directors or your VP, like, you, you know, you need to give them insights. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has the time, the luxury of time to just go looking for them, but I think a lot more people should. But again, I'm biased, I'm, I'm a data scientist. <laughs> Why do you think would one company do this? Like, why is Amazon pushing for that? Whereas TikTok and Google aren't as much. Do you, do you know why? It just, yeah. I feel like at Amazon's, the, the definition of roles was more blurry, right? Um, so uh, like, and, and Amazon, I got, I, I really got given, so I got given this area of ownership on the UK supply chain network. I didn't have to do any machine learning or data science. That was completely optional. Um, like, and, and so you can kind of carve out your role a little bit. There's more freedom, which is a bit more scary to be honest, when you start out a, a role, but there's more freedom in how your role needs to look like. But because of that, again, like you can't just ask, there's not a data team that's going to provide data for you. Like if you own a project, you're building it from end to end. Right. There's a lot of quotes around that because you're not going to start doing the software engineering part of a project on your own. Right. But you're expected to do all the, a lot of the heavy lifting. Whereas in Google and in TikTok, we have very, you know, we have a data science team, a machine learning team, product managers, program managers, software engineers, back end, front end. And like we have, uh, we have like, um, even PMs that start like that are kind of consultants and you need help on a project. You can get a PM that helps you with your project. That doesn't happen in Amazon. Like you really are expected to figure it out. And a big part of that is figuring out the data. Another part of that is figuring out the communication piece. Like it makes you, it makes you more full stack, not in data, but like mm -hmm. in, just in general. Um, and again, very scary when you first start out, at least it was for me, but you, you do learn a lot. Um, it, it's an interesting way to kind of see, to like, to, to define roles and responsibilities. Um, it's clearly worked well for Amazon, but you know, TikTok and Google aren't doing too bad either. So I think both ways are, are definitely valid. I think some people are going to prefer one over the other for sure though. So looking at those three companies again, I mean, you got into Amazon, Google, TikTok. Those are now data scientists there is probably one of the most competitive job in the market. I mean, it's super difficult to get a job there. So what would be your advice to land a job, a data science job at a big tech company, maybe your top three or yeah, your top three advice to, to get it. Ooh, top three advice. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I think the first one is be relentless. Um, you know, I, when I, when I was applying for banking, I remember 
Um, some, some person in HR told us, if you apply once and you get rejected, don't even bother applying again, you're flagged in the system. This is not the case in big tech. Um, I hired someone, um, it was their 32nd attempt um, mm -hmm. attempting for a role and the 32nd was successful, right? So the first one is be relentless. Um, so sorry, the first advice is be relentless. The second one is definitely, um, you have to think a little bit creatively. So the way I got my job at Amazon, right, was applying to every job, realizing I couldn't, getting a job for an interview, which I didn't want, and then flipping that into a full-time role, which kind of failed, but kind of failed successfully. It was a similar story at Google, actually. Again, I left Amazon after a few years thinking, all right, everyone's going to want to hire me. Wrong again. I applied to a ton of jobs. I didn't, I got, I started getting more successfully some answers. Once you have one big tech under your belt, I interviewed for LinkedIn, I interviewed for Ancestry, uh, but I remember I really wanted to land an interview at Google and I couldn't. Um, I applied and I was just getting rejected. So I then, I applied for this specific role and I reached out to, I got rejected, but I reached out to the director of the team and I told him, look, I've applied. And I didn't tell him I got rejected. I just told him, I've applied, I haven't heard back. Sometimes, you know, CVs get lost in the HR black hole or whatever it is. If you think my CV is interesting, yeah, feel free to forward it to hiring manager. If not, you know, have a great day. Uh, and then, you know, he sent me an, an email back saying, this looks great. And then a day later, I had an interview with Google and that's how I, I got my first job at Google. Um, so advice number two is generally just like use LinkedIn, like net network as much as possible. Feel free to ask people. Um, I don't know if this is similar outside of big tech, but in big tech, there are these even very simply. So if you can find the hiring manager, great. But more simply, there's the, all these referral programs internally. The, the idea that big tech has is that good people know other good people. And so to incentivize you to like refer your friends, there's usually some sort of hiring bonus, right? So if you want to work at Google or let's say at TikTok now, maybe you come to me and you say, look, Remy, I, I'm really interested in position. I take a look at your CV and I think, yeah, that looks pretty good. I'll refer you. I'll just ask you for your CV. And if you get hired, I get, I can't remember what it is, some cash bonus. Mm -hmm. So what I also, what I've also been known to do is some people like will spam people right on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, do this at your own risks, but you know, it is a bit of a numbers game, similar to the person that we hired after his 32nd attempt, like just keep applying um, is my second piece of advice. And then my third piece of advice is like, know, know what you're getting into when you apply into big tech, like really think if you want to get, like, I remember the reason I wanted to get a job in big tech at first is because I thought it was going to be so awesome, <laughs> which is like, just not the best career plan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you, you could really have, like I could have and should have thought this one a bit more through. Um, think about like the fact that the organizational impact is very low. Right, like you're not going to change how your team does something, much less your org or the company. You're never going to talk to the CEO. You're never going to talk to the CTO. You'll be lucky to meet your VP, um, but you'll have impact on a ton of users. Um, so th there is that balance, and like it's also like they are cool, right? And like you have the massage tiers and the kombucha, but it is still a macro corporation. So you know, I have friends that work in startups, and like the vibe is very different, and like as much as like these companies sell themselves as like startups and spirits, they're not, there's, mm -hmm. you know, hundred thousand plus employees in most of them. And so that comes up its downsides as well. Right. Um, it's, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, tr try not just to apply and go there for the prestige um, because it, it's it, at the end, it is just a job. And like, um, there are some really incredible things you can do in big tech and some unique opportunities but it, it is still just a job. So yeah, just think, well, this is the right one for you as well. But um, if it is, then definitely apply, uh, apply relentlessly. Now you agree that there is this trade-off between you have impact, but it feel, it doesn't feel as big as in a startup, because as you mentioned in a startup, you can completely change the tech stack or you can build a new model, which will double sales or things like that. You're not going to double sales at Amazon with with one model, right? Or maybe you will, you do, but yeah, probably not. Um, one thing that attracts me though in big techs is the fact that it looks like you're just working with super smart people and learning a lot from them. Is that something that you experience, like learning a lot from your coworkers or not more than at a startup? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never worked at a startup, right? I, mm -hmm. All of my experiences, um, I, I don't have a lot of the world view here. Um, I will say, yeah, we tend to have <clears throat> we tend to hire fairly good people. 
Um, we try to hire for diversity. I don't know how good of a job we do, honestly, but I, I have learned a ton um, from the people working around me. But again, I have learned a ton. Like again, there are skills that are, I think are really relevant in big tech as well. Um, like, how do you how do you like not how you solve a problem? How do you find a problem? Right? Um, I imagine not all startups have this problem. Right? Where like you're just you don't even know what to do. You hire people and like if left alone, they don't know what to do. So. Um, I have learned a ton, that's for sure. And the people we do hire are are generally very clever. Um, but it's so at Amazon we had this thing where anyone that you hired had to be better than fifty percent of of the existing team. Um, and like not everyone thinks this is a good strategy, right? I, I remember reading comments on LinkedIn thinking we should never do this. We should always upskill our staff. We should never hire smarter than our staff, right? So that's a that's a view that's not unique to tech, but that is very prevalent in tech. Um, so what's funny is also like I'm a hiring manager now and I look at the interviews we like the interview just like they keep getting harder <laughs> like I couldn't get the jobs anymore <laughs> um, and so it, it's definitely true that you see high caliber people usually in tech so now that you're a manager and that you're hiring as well we talked about the things we should do to get into big, big tech what are the mistakes or maybe a few things that people shouldn't do like the kind of red flags yeah, um, I mean, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot, of, I've seen a lot of different and funny things in interviews and on CVs. Um, I guess the first one is, if you're in an interview and you just don't know something, just like straight up tell me. Um, like just straight up tell me you don't know because the alternative usually is like using a lot of keywords like XG Boost and deep learning, and like it just gets messy really, really fast. Um, and the goal of the interview is to earn trust mostly right you have to like you have to sell yourself but it's mostly to earn trust and if you don't know something that's totally fine but i just need to know um things not to do yeah it's the same in your in your cv like honestly the biggest mistake i see in cvs is like keyword stuffing where it's like, it's impossible that you've worked in like deep learning and large language models, you know, and like XG, like there's like, you've done a hundred things in like, you've worked there for seven months as an intern. Like that's just, um, maybe you have, I'm like <laughs> mistaken, but it's just, it's important to like, I, I see people just try too hard and like, whether it's like exaggerate too much or straight up lie, um, it just never ever works. Um, that That's the main one, honestly, just be be honest. Um, the other thing I've seen a lot, to be honest, is during interviews, like th this gets very, I guess, very practical in advice, but, um, I see a lot of people not thinking out loud through problems, whether it's like a, a SQL question or like, think about how this metric would you know, design a metric to X, Y, Z. Um, like you're totally allowed to take some time to think, but you can't take like five entire minutes on a zoom call to think that's a long time to like, just be in silence and then not have an answer. Because I have a lot of people do that. Like the goal is to see how you think a lot, right? It's like, again, it's just all about earning trust. And like, all right, can this person think through a problem? Do they know who to ask for help? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if this, <laughs> this is what you were going for. No, no, I, I think, no, no, that's great. And this makes sense. Um, yeah, I think thinking, yeah, showing your work basically rather than just trying to come up with the right answer is kind of a classic thing that, yeah, lots of people don't do enough um maybe they think they just need to get the answer right and you don't care how they got to the answer but if they if they can explain what they are thinking um even if they get the answer wrong you might give them credit and you might hire them because you see that their thinking is good their assumptions were a bit wrong but at least they made sense and they're thinking clearly the goal is not to get the right answer it's more to get the right thinking process i guess and yeah. And the other stuff on deep learning is also quite interesting. When I looked for a first job, I took only the experience where I did deep learning or advanced algorithms would be relevant. And like all my other, I did like a big internship where I was using, it was an algorithm, but less deep learning and more just some simple logic. And I thought this was irrelevant because I didn't use deep learning and I realized that that's wrong. And during one interview, some people asked me about this experience and they were quite impressed by the project. Although I didn't 
use deep learning. And I was like, how is that interesting? It's not deep learning. Um, so yeah, don't try to make up your project or don't think that just you just need to know state of the art algorithms. Sometimes you need to know them, but oftentimes it's just, yeah, better to tell the truth, mention what you've worked on. And if it's not deep learning, it could also be quite interesting. For sure. hundred percent. I, I have one last one, I guess that comes to mind. Um, this is as a thing to do is like, I, I underestimated when I was applying for jobs and I, I got better at it afterwards, but how important it is to like, to be excited for the company you're about to work for. And ideally even for the team you're about to work for. Um, because like Google is so big that like, it's especially for the team, if you can, um, like one of the things I was really excited about joining TikTok was it working in trust and safety, working and helping keep the platform safe. Um, and so like showcasing like strong motivations and like, it's funny because it's like, to showcase your strong motivate, like you just almost you, you just have to say you're motivated. Like you don't have to have some like crazy Batman origin story mm-hmm. about like why this job matters. Like it is just a job. But like just say you're interested in the job. Say why TikTok is interesting for you or Google or Facebook, whatever. Um, like why the team specifically interests you. Um, and this is doubly valid if you're going for an internship position. Like I've seen internship offers um, at Amazon get made because of how motivated the person was, how excited they were about the position. Um, obviously they still had the experience, you know, but it's like, we that gets sold a lot. I saw interns get made full time just because of how like, they just showed like a bit of passion and like they were there, they showed up and like just enthusiasm for the role. Um, it's, it's something that is also, I think a bit undervalued. Like sometimes I'll ask people if they have any questions for me and like, they just, they don't, and like it's not it's not necessarily a red flag let's be one one hundred one mm-hmm. thing clear it's not a red flag you can do really well in your interview you don't have a question for your interview great <laughs> if you're right for the job i'll give you the job um but like it, it just it puts a lot of points in your favor to like have thoughtful questions uh also thoughtful questions there, no questions are better than like bad questions by the way sometimes you see people like try to pull like all right i need to ask two questions because it's what the youtube guy told me to do <laughs> it's like it's like it's just like the most random questions I get I get asked sometimes. Like, what what flavor of sequel do you use? It's like, do you really care? Because like <laughs> I barely care. Um anyways, so yeah, like if you can have thoughtful questions, if you can show your interest for the team, for the company, um, it's it's always a huge plus. Yeah, thanks. I mean, lots of great advice there. And yeah, I agree that motivation is definitely quite important let's just finish the episode with one advice if you just had one advice for someone to progress in their career what would it be oh just one um i would say i would say know where you want to go um i was surrounded with really ambitious people on amazon um i got promoted very quickly and i got more and more interesting projects and it made me be ambitious, but I didn't know what I wanted to grow into. Was it more technical role? Was it a tech lead? Was it management? I just didn't know. I just kind of wanted to grow. And it just creates these conflicting feelings, but also it's hard to trace your path if you don't know where you want to go. Um, and it's okay not to be sure, but like try, you think managing is for you, try to get an intern. You think tech lead is for you, try to like get more technical. So I would say it's, just, it's important to really think through what it is you enjoy. Um, and the advice I got given, which was really good by, by one of my old bosses was like, think past the title. Don't just think I want to become director of X, Y, and Z, right? Think I want to maybe work with product managers and software engineers to build the next, whatever, generations of something. Um, so really think through your, your career and where you want to go before trying to go for growth at all costs. Otherwise you'll, you'll end up in jobs you don't want or that just aren't right for you. And, it's um yeah it, it's worth taking the time to think it through and it's worth finding either a mentor or a manager that's happy to to walk you through this kind of start exercises well remy thanks a lot it was amazing to learn from you and record this episode thanks again yeah have a great day in the us and hope to catch up very soon all right thanks so much for having me neil this was really fun <laughs>